Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast, where we challenge the stigma associated with mental illness through conversations about a variety of issues impacting mental health. Here we bring you news, views, and interviews that intrigue, educate, and celebrate recovery. Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast. My name is Daryl Mathers, and uh, we have a special guest today. Dr. Phil Klassen, who's a psychiatrist, but also the VP of Medical Medical Affairs here at Ontario Shores. Welcome, Dr. Klassen. Thank you. And the reason you're here is uh, we're going to talk specifically today about uh, trauma. And one of the reasons we wanted to have this discussion is it's a really popular word in in the world today. Um, Sometimes it may be used in the improper context in our everyday life when we talk about, you know, a bad experience at a grocery store being traumatic or different experiences. Uh, I was mentioning my son at school using the word traumatizing, not really fully understanding what it's, you know, what that actually means. And I uh, thought we'd go through, you know, kind of kind of explore the topic of trauma today. And maybe we can just start the conversation by, you know, defining trauma. Like what is Well, like uh, a lot of um, human experiences, it can fall on a continuum from something that's relatively mild, uh, an aversive experience of some kind, I suppose. But um, generally speaking, when we think of trauma, we think of something that poses a serious physical or psychological threat to the integrity of the person. So it can be a physical threat or it can be a psychological threat that is relatively severe um, and, and that would be anticipated by that sufferer uh, to pose a threat to their integrity. By integrity, we could mean bodily integrity, or it could mean their psychological integrity. When you talk about you know, an event and severity, the severity can really uh, it's be a wide um, margin, I'm guessing, you know, the word I'm trying to find. But um, you know, we, talk, we often associate trauma with uh, maybe first responders and uh, people who have experienced horrific events. But it can really, can it not be um, defined, stumbling a bit here, but what I'm trying to get at is we all experience trauma differently, do we not? And what may be traumatic for one person may not be traumatic for the other. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, typically there is a, broadly speaking, a threshold below which you probably aren't going to get any kind of significant or lasting symptomatology, but you're quite right that Uh, There are a number of clusters of things that can impact how a particular person will process a given event or set of events. And broadly speaking, they would include, so to speak, pre-trauma factors. In other words, what kinds of experiences, what age, what gender, those kinds of things that person is when they come to the trauma. Secondly, the objective severity of the trauma. There is a relationship between the objective severity of the trauma and outcomes. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, the post-trauma process, the extent to which a person is supported, is able to process those kinds of uh, experiences can be very important uh, to their longer-term outcome. Somebody who's experienced trauma, um, what might they, what symptoms might they be dealing with and when? Like, is there a timeline? Like, if I have experienced a traumatic event, on Tuesday, am I going to start feeling the impact of, of trauma or... How does that whole process work sometimes for people? Yeah, there are enormous individual differences, first of all, in people's responses to trauma. So, uh, in fact, studies have shown that the majority of adults at some point in their life will experience an event that would meet criterion A in the DSM-5, our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, for a serious uh, 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 traumatic event. And the majority of those individuals will not experience really lasting or severe symptoms. So one of the key factors then is, you you know, is some of the unique characteristics of the person and the trauma and also whether it's repeated. Um, All that to say, it's a little bit like COVID-19 in a way, in that some people will have minimal symptomatology and other people moderate and other people severe symptomatology. Typically, the symptomatology will grow over days to weeks in the context of an acute event if a person's going to have a more serious outcome. It may peak in months, generally speaking, and the majority of individuals will experience some degree of spontaneous resolution within about two years of that trauma. But we know, of course, that some people don't experience spontaneous resolution, and that may be particularly 
relevant if they're experiencing repeated or cumulative trauma. And in that scenario, that's if it's untreated? That's if somebody has experienced a traumatic event and, and not sought help? Or so I should probably clarify the word spontaneous resolution. So that, uh, that uh, in sort of psychiatric jargon, unfortunately, means uh, that the symptoms will uh, decline and even go away without an intervention. So that will happen for, for a lot of individuals. They're, they'll experience that without an intervention. With an intervention, of course, um, in some respects sort of akin to antibiotics, um, you can really speed up the process of the symptom resolution. Uh, there's a lot of people that get antibiotics for infections that might get better all on their own, uh, but they would have unnecessary suffering. Uh, and we can abbreviate their period of suffering with that intervention. Similarly, with, uh, let's say, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is the classic problematic outcome of trauma, um, many people will experience decline in symptoms or even a complete cessation of those symptoms over time, but that can take a significant period of time, and that is in the absence of further trauma. And with treatment, uh, you can significantly accelerate that process because we have available treatments that are very effective for PTSD. A word or a term you hear a lot now is, especially uh, you know, at our organization, but mental health centers everywhere, is trauma-informed care. So can you kind of describe you know, what trauma-informed care, and maybe, maybe the evolution of it in the last few decades, and, and, and what that means to somebody who might be going through the system you know, with the trauma? So trauma-informed care, uh, just to be clear, is not um, typically understood to be treatment for trauma. It's typically understood to be an umbrella term that describes a kind of uh, understanding and a kind of uh, trying to get to know your patient that is broadly applied across diagnoses. You know, one of the things that I think we're realizing now is that trauma, particularly earlier trauma, childhood trauma, adolescent trauma, can be relevant to lots of different mental health conditions, not just PTSD. And it can have a negative impact on the presentation of those conditions. So for example, uh, while this literature is in its early phases at this point, there is a literature suggesting that early trauma can contribute to whether somebody might develop schizophrenia. And there's also a literature that says, if you have symptoms of trauma, it actually affects the course of your illness, of that schizophrenia illness. So trauma-informed care uh, is an approach by care providers uh, to trying to understand what kinds of challenges that person has had that brought them to the place they're at today, whether they're coming for treatment of depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, or a host of other conditions. It's a lens. It's, it's an orientation or an approach on the part of care providers. Yeah, as you were describing that, I, I know one of the uh, issues that people who've experienced trauma tend to have is uh, difficulty in relationships. And that lens that you described is, is more or less, you know, from what I understand it, is trying to understand where that person is coming from and why some of these symptoms or behaviors are, are happening. So for the everyday person who might be dealing with somebody in their life or trying to um, you know, work on a relationship with somebody who's experienced trauma and may have other mental health issues, what are some of the lenses that they can have uh, to help them understand uh, that person better? It probably makes sense, and this is a little bit of an artificial construct, but just for the purpose of this conversation, to, to divide what we're talking about in terms of trauma into people that have had chronic cumulative trauma, particularly if it's in the earlier years, versus individuals that have had a single episode of trauma. Um, the reason I say that is because if people have chronic cumulative trauma, particularly if it starts early, although also sometimes later, um, it has a more significant effect on their relationship with the world. It begins to find its way into their personality, into their worldview, into their expectations, into the dialogue that they have with themselves, into their emotion regulation. In other words, chronic cumulative trauma tends to have a more pervasive effect on relationships, which was your initial question, on that person's self-concept, on the number and type of symptoms they have, and so on. Whereas a single episode of trauma, 
let's say, an otherwise untraumatized person who was overseas and in an earthquake, and they saw some terrible things in that earthquake, but it was a single period of trauma in their life, in those individuals, uh, the impact is more likely to be time limited and less pervasive, including on relationships. Um, in the former case, the longer term trauma, I think what you see a lot of is you see a lot of emotional reactivity. You see a lot of mistrust because people begin to sort of quote unquote learn that the world is an unsafe place. You may see a lot of um, troubles with self-esteem and self-defeating behavior and a very negative self-concept because that internal dialogue the person has with themselves, which is trauma-informed, uh, is often uh, quite harsh on themselves and harsh on the world, understandably, you, you know, given the experiences that they've had. So again, to summarize, the impact on relationships, on function generally for people, is typically a product of the duration and sometimes also the timing of the trauma. So somebody living with somebody who's either receiving care or treatment um, for a mental health issue and maybe you know, have experience with trauma, um, how can we support people who, have, um, who are going through this, who are going through the healing process, if you will, um, uh, in a traumatic event? Sure. I think one of the first things for us to think about is, is identifying that people are traumatized. Excuse me. Uh, in in situations where the external trauma is dramatic, very apparent, people may think of it more. And generally speaking, there is more of a dialogue in the community these days about trauma. But people can also experience cumulative trauma, where each episode is more subtle. But over a period of months to years, it can have a significant effect. And people may not be thinking trauma in quite the same way because that person wasn't sexually assaulted or they weren't. Uh, involved in a natural disaster of some kind. So recognition of the possibility of trauma is important for caregivers and for families and loved ones of a person. I think the second thing, once the recognition piece has been dealt with, is probably, um, I, I would say, to, to encourage people to seek care. We have very effective treatments for trauma now. Um, mostly, they're psychological treatments. Uh, medication treatments typically are adjunctive if people are having particular difficulties with depression or anxiety. But the primary treatment for trauma is not medication. The primary treatment for trauma is a psychotherapeutic approach that typically involves some combination of exposure uh, to that uh, traumatic event or events and, at least as importantly, um, cognitive work, a kind of cognitive restructuring of the meaning and the thoughts that the persons have around trauma. And in many cases, it doesn't have to be a protracted therapy. Uh, so uh, encouraging people, step two, I would say, is encouraging people to seek care. Um, and then I, I guess another step would be uh, supporting people. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, one of the key factors in whether PTSD or trauma-related symptoms <clears throat> are likely to become lasting is the degree of support uh, and, and um, understanding that the, the sufferer has, uh, and in particular that they don't lose social support in the context of that trauma. Um, recognizing that most people are going to get better. Most people are going to, to experience an improvement, either in treatment and, and oftentimes even uh, spontaneously if you, if you give them enough time. Um, those would be, I guess, the key elements that I would pass on to people. In order just a few days past Remembrance Day here, and in Canada, and you know, you often around November 11th, you you see images from World War One, World War Two, some of the more uh, you know famous conflicts in our history. I think back to that era when they were <laughs> they were likely exposed to trauma and PTSD and how they dealt with it or didn't deal with it. I would say for decades, and kind of look, looking back explains you know for us who had grandparents or parents who were in the war. Um, understanding maybe some of their behaviors uh, later in life. Now we have far more awareness around trauma, especially for first responders and, and military personnel. And, but I'm guessing it's just, it's still not uh, quite there. So 
maybe, you know, for somebody, I think it's kind of difficult too, because one of the issues is relationships and how do you support somebody and encourage somebody to receive treatment who has experienced a traumatic event when they have difficulties, maybe in that moment uh, with relationships. So I guess, I guess my, my question is, you know, somebody who has, whether military first responder or whatever the case may be, if they're able to identify that they are part of a traumatic event and seek help uh, right away, how much better off would they be in terms of success and treatment? So, uh, I mean, in, in my response, I'm not trying to provide any particular direction to administration of first responders or the military, those kinds of things. But I think what you see more and more now, which I think is a good thing, is I think you see more and more screening of first responders or military or police personnel on a serial basis. In other words, we know that there are real individual differences in who gets PTSD and how bad their PTSD might be. So it makes sense to screen people in higher risk occupations on a regular basis with pencil and paper measures, <clears throat> excuse me, that can help us to see if trauma symptoms are starting to develop because obviously there's an advantage for us to be able to intervene early as opposed to waiting for trauma symptoms to become serious or severe. Um, but again, I mean, the message I think that I, I, I would, would offer to people is, um, you know, we have effective treatments. Um, the, the more severe the PTSD is uh, and, and the longer that it's been around and the more uh, that it's been woven into a person's worldview and personality and adaptive style, uh, the longer it can take to treat or the more challenging the treatment might be. But the message is certainly um, there are great treatments, cognitive processing therapy, uh, trauma-informed um, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, and exposure therapy, sometimes augmented by something called EMDR, uh, are key treatments and typically, in over 80% of cases, um, very effective treatments for trauma. One of the things we were talking about at the beginning was, uh, you know, kind of the word trauma in our everyday uh, vernacular. And, you know, we know how important words are in mental health. You know, we've been fighting for years to reduce the stigma and, um, you know, it's not uncommon for somebody to use the word schizophrenia or schizo or uh, psycho or all those words that we, you know, we don't want people using. Trauma is one that, and PTSD, you hear, you know, quite often in, you know, every day somebody will say, this experience has given me PTSD or, you know, I've been traumatized by that event. And I'm wondering, like, from your perspective, does kind of the, the loose use of those kind of terms, um, does that maybe from a societal perspective, um, would that concern you that, it, that people may not reach out for help because we're, I don't know, we're trying to normalize it in that terms, like everybody experiences trauma every day, or does that concern you at all, how we use those kind of terms? It's a great question. I'm not sure that I know the empirical answer to your question. Uh, my initial response to that would be, um, yes, it may be that at times we use the word trauma too loosely or that at times it gets thrown around in contexts that are not, quote unquote, truly traumatic. But I think that that's um, a, a very tolerable side effect or byproduct of the fact that we are talking more about trauma. And so to me, it's acceptable in the sense that it's a small part of a larger and growing dialogue about recognizing and addressing trauma. It just made me think of, you know, the movies in the 80s and 90s, any cop movie like um, Lethal Weapon, for example, anytime they'd experience something uh, traumatic, they'd be forced to go see the, the shrink, they'd call it, right? And like, they'd always find a way to avoid actually spending time with the, with the psychiatrist in the show. And now you see in the media, which is like highly influential, that um, you know, the, you're seeing the after effects of uh, some of these traumatic events played out in media, whether it's through documentaries or um, you know, traditional film. And I wonder if those kind of images that we're seeing more uh, are helpful. Is it a, like a truer narrative that we're seeing uh, reflected in our society that we're, is going to help uh, people who've experienced trauma? I think we're having much more um, thoughtful and honest conversations about trauma. I think one of the things for us to think about as well, and this is true in mental health generally, not just related to trauma, uh, 
is how to reach particular groups, maybe particular cultural groups or subcultural groups uh, that uh, have not yet been maybe as comfortable in talking about mental health issues or reaching out for care, <clears throat> whether that's trauma or something else. So it may be that there are particular, that we haven't done enough with respect to particular populations, let's say of new Canadians, or with respect to particular occupations. So I, I think, yes, in the mainstream media and, and in mainstream conversation, I think uh, the dialogue around mental health and mental health conditions and trauma has become uh, much more vigorous and much more um, available to, to everybody. But uh, there, there may be areas still for us to work on in terms of extending that dialogue out. Um, you know, I think for a long time, it was harder for first responders to talk, for example, about trauma because it was not, um, it, it, it maybe wasn't as much of their sort of, um, their subculture to discuss those kinds of vulnerabilities. So for example, I think that's changed with time. But I think we can continue to have those conversations, look for groups or subgroups of people where it might be fruitful to have those conversations uh, so that we can bring them uh, into, the, into the dialogue about trauma as well. This just made me think of early in the days of the pandemic you know, on Terra Shore specifically, um, I think it was in May, realizing the kind of the scope of the situation we were embarking upon with COVID-19. Um, we rolled out the healthcare worker assist program, maybe not specifically for trauma, but I think it was, you know, there's certainly a trauma piece to it. And then later on with the first responder assist program, again, recognizing that um, that was a vulnerable population with everything we were experiencing during the pandemic. And that's just an example of what Ontario Shores did. But um, that quick of an action by a mental health hospital, and I'm sure other organizations have done something similar, like how important is it for us to be the response of like to, to see something, you know, something's unfolding, here are the potential ramifications, let's prepare and do it quickly. Like how important is it for us moving forward to have, kind of have that mindset? Yeah, again, uh, if, you, if you're able to identify um, phenomena that may produce trauma, and if you're able to identify uh, who is experiencing trauma symptoms early, then I think you uh, are in a better position to minimize the damage uh, from that trauma and from those trauma symptoms. Um, and generally speaking, I think promote understanding and a sense of community that you know we care and we want to do something and we can do something. So I think again, early identification, early intervention is important. Um, yeah, I mean, the argument is sometimes made in the context of limited resources, um, you know, what's the right approach? I mean, by that I mean, if you have 100 people on a continuum of severity, let's say, with respect to trauma symptoms, and 50 spots available for treatment, uh, you know, can, can you develop um, novel approaches so that you can deliver just enough care uh, to, to people uh, that, that have some symptom burden? I think we're seeing that with respect to mood and anxiety and trauma and other things, which is, I think the focus now, at times using technology-enabled care or different coaching models, in addition to the more traditional and more intensive therapies, uh, to, we, we're trying to get people into different levels of sort of a stepped care process. And I think that is part of what you have to do along with the early identification is, is fit the, the intensity of the care to the intensity of the symptoms so that we can maximize access. You've touched on a lot of things. I'm, uh, I'm just wondering if there's anything about trauma that maybe that you haven't touched on that people, you know, whether it's uh, people who have experienced trauma or living with somebody who's experienced trauma, is there anything else that, you know, they should know or you'd like to share? I mean, the effects of trauma are very far reaching, uh, particularly if it's early and sustained and severe. Um, you know, in some respects, really, we should contemplate um, early childhood adversities like physical and sexual abuse really as a public health problem uh, because it's, it's such a, uh, it, it, they can have such traumatic, uh, pardon me, such uh, significant impacts down the road. The other thing we haven't touched on, uh, but it's sort of in the same area as what we have been talking about is the issue of intergenerational trauma. So trauma that is, that is passed on from generation to generation and 
and in Canada, perhaps one of the, the, the most clear examples of that has to do with indigenous peoples uh, in, in Canada, where the, 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 you know, the intense trauma that a group of people experience uh, so significantly impacts them uh, that in terms of their parenting and their capacity to be able to, um, to, to be healthy and whole as a community, uh, they're compromised and, and then their children may also experience um, traumatic outcomes. Um, I think we're aware of that at this point, but I think that's something to think about. Again, particularly that maybe in some new Canadians and some subcultural groups, we may see that as well, not just in indigenous persons. Um, but I think the overarching message for me would be there are effective treatments for trauma. I think that the, I'd like to, I guess, if we're going to end it here, I'd like to end it uh, with a message of hope, which is uh, you really can get better. Uh, from trauma symptoms. It's not something that needs to uh, dominate the rest of your life. Before we end it there, just, you know, maybe think of something else. It's just how much we're learning about trauma. Like you mentioned, you know, uh, a couple recent findings is related to schizophrenia. And also we know, you know, certainly going back to uh, uh, Remembrance Day and what we knew about trauma then versus now. Like, do you expect our knowledge of, of trauma to grow even more over the next couple decades? Yes. I mean, there's a lot of knowledge that we have <clears throat> accumulated over the last few decades in terms of, you know, how it looks and what it does and uh, the impacts it has on people and who is maybe a little bit more and less likely to have uh, uh, significant symptoms after a traumatic experience. I think some of the things that you may see in the decades to come will have to do with the... Um, for lack of a better word, the biological effects of, of early childhood trauma, of early adversities, and perhaps also of, of, of later PTSD. By which I mean, there's evidence to suggest that early trauma in childhood or adolescence can actually have an effect on genes that determine whether you're gonna suffer depression or whether you're gonna develop schizophrenia or those kinds of things. So. I think the, one of the interesting frontiers for us will be to understand um, how we actually have an impact at a cellular level, uh, sometimes a lasting impact, uh, when people experience trauma, in, uh, particularly in childhood or adolescence. I think one you know, maybe piece to it is um, being around or work or being in a relationship with somebody who's experienced trauma, whether I'm, you know, any of the traumas you described, the amount of patience that we need to have um, as humans. I think uh, it's hard, trauma is really hard to understand if you're not experiencing it. I'm sure it's hard to experience, hard to understand why you're experiencing it, but when you're, in, whether it's in a, in a household unit or uh, friendships or whatever the relationships, it can be, um, it can be frustrating, I'm guessing, and the, the person on the on the other end um, must need a, a, quite a bit of patience in order to kind of maintain that relationship. Yeah, many of the symptoms of trauma often inadvertently push people away. They push loved ones away. Um, so, for example, uh, the emotional reactivity, uh, the avoidance of certain kinds of activities or persons, uh, the anger, uh, the mistrust, those kinds of things. Uh, they will have the impact of pushing away the people that, in fact, could be part of the solution uh, for that person. So I think it's helpful for family or loved ones to appreciate that. Um, that pushing away is often a part of the condition uh, and to be patient in that respect. We're almost done. But I keep, okay. Every time you answer a question, you give me an idea for another one. But um, family therapy is, you know, <clears throat> quite popular in, in mental health settings. Um, is there a place for family therapy in the treatment of trauma? Uh, not so much, I think, in a formal therapy sense. I think it's very important for families to understand the origins of trauma, the symptoms of trauma, the time course of trauma, the treatments of trauma, and how to support a traumatized person. So I think that there's an important educational component to it. Um, it's less the case that we have typically a, a formal family therapy. Generally speaking, um, it's more educational than therapy per se.
Well, it's a very uh, educational experience uh, talking to you today, and I really appreciate you taking the time. And um, I think we've addressed a lot of the, um, the questions and issues around trauma. So thank you very much. Thanks, Gerald. My pleasure.